in our particular case, uh, being able to build a system that will be able to handle the nominal operating cases within our operational design domain that we craft for this very first version, which is a human guided convoy system consisting of two semi trucks and two drivers taking turns. There's a driver engaged in the lead truck. There's a driver in the second truck, but oh, cool. the, the driver in the second truck is not actually driving. It's uh, in the bunk. It's in the sleeper berth, resting, taking the federally mandated rest as the truck drives itself and follows the leader from a close distance. So effectively one active driver helps moving two trucks at a time and two drivers can periodically swap space places. So you never have to go down. It's almost around the clock, you can have a uh, an operating convoy on the roads. You can this way deliver twice as much cargo to twice as far and twice as fast. That's incredible. While uh, reducing the operating costs significantly, reducing the fuel consumption and associated carbon emissions significantly. Awesome. And basically making the crafting a win-win-win for all the stakeholders involved. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Chetan Marichli. Uh, Chetan is the CEO of Locomation. Uh, they are a company doing incredible things with autonomous trucks right here in Pittsburgh. Chetan, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I've been wanting to have you for a while, but you are an incredibly busy man, one of the hardest guys in Pittsburgh to get a hold of, understandably. It's been it's been a, a it's been a busy year so far, and I'm very really grateful for it. It's been a, it's been a delightful year. That's awesome. So you mentioned you just went up to ninety employees when we were kind of yeah yeah. Up. So yeah, we were nineteen in September of uh, twenty, and just a little bit uh, after. Uh, a little bit uh, uh, later than a year, we are now 90 plus. So we quad we effectively quadrupled in the last year. Holy moly, that's that's incredible. So what was that like, I guess, commanding well, that kind of a growth? I mean, I, I can only imagine myself. So from the very beginning, uh, myself and my co-founders and our entire team, basically, we, we are deep, deep believers in right sizing. Yeah. So you need to right size the team, you need to right size the uh, the problem. You need to scope the problem at hand properly so that you can actually wrap your head around it and you can actually come up with a definitive bounded plan. That makes sense to me. Um, and uh, from the very beginning, again, we knew that this is not a, a problem for five people or 15 people or 20 <laughs> people. It's not even a, a problem for 90 or 100 people. So we are still growing fast and we will be uh, probably in the, in the low hundreds in the next couple of years. Wow. Uh, but it is not growth for the sake of growth, or it's not being under the false impression of, yeah, all we need is more people, and with more people, the problem will solve itself. So that is not, not how we are operating, and that's Smart. not how we believe uh, a company should operate. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So I guess then, I mean, I I can only assume I've never worked on self-driving, but it seems incredibly complicated. Like you need a lot of you know human power to solve it. For sure. I mean, there's nothing ever easy about well anything robotics, right? So you, yeah, you're a roboticist, sure. and you know that uh, uh, systems thinking and and co coming up with complex systems doing meaningful work is very difficult. Uh, doing that as a product that then you can scale and do it in a reliable and cost-effective way is maybe an order of magnitude, maybe more. Uh, yeah, I difficult. believe that. And with automotive, you have no room for errors. Right, in, in right. In any form. Right. Uh, and that's all, of course, is driven by intellectual power. Yeah, makes sense. But intellectual power has to be planned. And um, what we are trying to do, and I say trying to do, uh, because that's a that's an ever growing and ever improving strategy. We are not perfect. We were never perfect, and most likely we will never be perfect. Nobody is. Uh, but what we are trying to do, and trying to do a little bit better every day, is to look at again the stage we are at, 
what are the imminent deliverables for the foreseeable future? Yeah. What is the uh, doing basically a gap analysis and needs assessment? Awesome. What we need in terms of capabilities, in terms of technology, and what we need in terms of resources, financial resources, physical resources like test tracks or office space, etc., and human capital, of course. Yeah. How, how much engineering, project management, design, uh, what kind of skills and how much of that. Uh, and we are trying to grow the organization to that right level. In the meantime, also trying to reinvent the organization's internal structure so that we can maintain culture, we can maintain communication, and we can maintain alignment. And these are not fire and forget type of problems. You don't say that, okay, so let's have a great culture. And then you figure it out, you write it down. You're done forever. You're done forever. It's not like that. You're going to yeah. wake up the next day and you're going to fight to, to keep that intact or improve it. So what are some of the cultural things you find yourself having to sort of push back and how do you fix those alignment issues? Not necessarily push back. I, I, I've been, I've been, uh, I'm the luckiest person in the world and we've been extremely fortunate to uh, have built a team with so many fabulous, like-minded, genuine, wonderful people that you would love to spend time, even if you were not working at the same place. Yeah, that's awesome. And that sounds like a dream. And one of the things that yeah, myself- It's a dream when you build a team like that. Exactly. I've only ever done it on a smaller scale, but the, I admire that. The, the uh, beautiful part of that I am so proud of is this was deliberate. So. Myself and my co-founders, when we were still at, at CMU and we were thinking about starting a company, one of the earliest exercises, it's just like five of us, nothing, no team, no money, no, no nothing. It's just an ideation phase. One of the first things we did was to write down the values that we want to build a company around. Oh, cool. And what kind of a culture we wanted to build, what kind of a company we wanted to build. And of course, everybody listed there. Uh, their priorities and they're maybe over 80%, 90% over that. Uh, and uh, one of the, the, the big patterns there was that we wanted to build a place where we as individuals would be excited to wake up every day and come to. I feel and you on we, that. we would love to build a, a team where we would be excited as individuals to come and see every day, to hang out, to work yeah. with, to accomplish things together. And again, so far, it's been wonderful, not without challenges, but wonderful, extremely rewarding. Awesome. And I'm, I, I'm very excited about the, the future. Sure. No, that's, that's really cool. And I mean, yeah, no, I, I've definitely, um, I can admire that a lot. Sorry, I didn't mean to ask like a, like a trip you up question, by the way. No, of course, that's fine. You know, it's somebody who manages people myself i'm always interested in kind of how i can go wrong and, and how you uh you keep it on the right track and i mean that's that's awesome i'm glad you've been able to achieve that goal yeah it's 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 interesting uh, one of the things i keep thinking about a lot uh is the relationship between form and function yeah in the context of organizational design oh cool so and that is something that, that i was not aware of that i kind of dawned on me at some point and I've started paying some attention to it. I started spending some time thinking about it. Do you, what, what, to build, like if, if your end product is something and you know what that end product is, in our case, it's autonomous driving, yeah. self-driving trucks, self-driving vehicles in general. What is the form of the organization that will produce that function? Yeah. And that is a, um, a rather, it's a, it's a quintessential design that's awesome. Uh, a, a question, but I, I found that that's actually unusually relevant in, in organizational design too. And the trick, and maybe another challenge there is, this is just like everything else about a startup. It's not static. Yeah, of course. It's almost like sewing clothes for a, for a baby. Like what you, <laughs> you, you do something and it fits the now. <laughs> and in three months, well, it was a very nice sweater, but it's, it was, that was then. So you, now you need something new. Yeah. Embracing that dynamism. It's not a fire and forget. It's not a one-time thing that you will have to. Okay. That makes sense. Continuously spend time and, and energy in 
keeping the ship afloat in the most yeah. optimal sense. So it's not even that something goes horribly wrong. It's that the organization changes by nature of its size or the challenges you're facing at that point in time. Yeah. Look, your current needs are, you know, absolutely. you have to adapt to fit that. Absolutely. And this, it's a, it's a two-sided story. So when you accept the fact that, well, this is going to be dynamic and whatever we do now, we will have to change. There is a, um, there's a lamenting end of that. Oh, like we are going to do this. It's going to be a throwaway work. Like it's, we will have to do that again. So yeah, of course, like there's some effort that's not going to live forever. I mean, all, the, none of it is. None of that is. <laughs> uh, but the beauty is that it also makes you an extremely resilient uh, uh, entity yeah. uh, and uh, gives you the, the blank check to be adventurous. So you can try out, you can, hey, like, let's try this and let's monitor how it how it goes. If it's great, well, okay, so maybe we'll adapt to that and we'll keep it. If it doesn't work out, we get to make mistakes because in a couple of months, we have to redo that substantially anyways. It's a beautiful way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I found in my own work that attitude of just not being afraid to fail is one of the most empowering things that you can embrace. I mean, one thing I keep telling my team uh, is that yeah, we should, we should embrace them. We should actually encourage, uh, taking risks yeah. and, and failing or making mistakes, making mistakes is perfectly fine. And everybody knows that already. Oh, yeah, we should yeah, make engineers mistakes. know that. Right. <laughs> but what I tell the, my, my team is that it is okay. While it is okay to make mistakes, it's not okay to repeat mistakes. Amen to that. You and <laughs> thank you. That's and, and, beautiful. and my, my kind of tongue in a cheek joking version of that is there are always more exciting new mistakes to be made let's not repeat the old boring mistakes so like i like that so i always tell my teams to you know it's okay to make a mistake so long as you don't repeat it it's the way i word the same thing but i don't say there's always more exciting mistakes to be made may i use that hey be my guest thank you <laughs> appreciate it of course now that's that's such a beautiful way to lead and i think to just encourage you know, curiosity. I, I really, really like that. We know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. Again, like we have to, we have to, uh, I mean, it's, it's okay and healthy to have egos. We all have egos and otherwise we wouldn't be doing what we are trying to do. Um, but having egos, um, uh, should not get in the way. So we should accept the fact that we know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. And the only way to, know more about what we don't know is to carefully and adventurously explore yeah but with by mo continuous to monitoring what's it's not it should not be open-ended it should not be opaque it should not be random yeah that there has to, like, it, it has to be informed well I, I keep a journal every time i make a mistake at work and i oh, write it down i try to analyze it and then i have bullet points at the top of the journal of rules to kind of do business and, and you know conduct myself professionally by and so every time I screw up, you know, I, I add like a bullet point, you know, of like, okay, if I followed this rule, I would have made that mistake. That's wonderful. So, I wish I was a, a disciplined enough person to do that. It sounds like you're doing it though. I mean, you just maybe have a Nothing is written yeah, <laughs> by me at least. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, as long as you have somebody recording it though, and, and, you know, learning from it and adapting, I mean, I think you're still doing the same exact thing only probably on a grander scale. I mean, it sounds like well, one of the, I mean, it's, it's, you can write things down, of course, and you should every time you, you can afford to, uh, but ultimately this whole culture thing is extremely folkloric. If, if you will, it's, it's, yeah. it's very verbal and it's very through osmosis. And what you need to do is to basically keep repeating the values, keep repeating the vision, keep, and of course, not repeating just for the sake of repeating, as long as you are genuinely believing in that, which yeah, makes sense. I do. Um, when you start, when you start to get tired of, of hearing your own voice, <laughs> now maybe you are making strides and actually disseminating that information. So interesting. Rep borderline boring repetition is, is key. You have to hear that so many times for for it to actually sink and nice. that's not that it doesn't mean that people don't want to listen it's it's just basic human psychology yeah it makes sense true for us like you have to keep motivating yourself continuously it's, it has to be a very regimented uh thing 
I completely agree. I mean, there's so many times when, you know, you don't want to do something like, eh, you know, it's bed is so comfy. I think I'll just lay here. I think Marcus Aurelius wrote that in meditations, right? Beds are very comfy though. Yeah. Like we have to... <laughs> <laughs> but there's things that need doing, you know, True. <laughs> the whole world is out there. And so, yeah. Yeah. Having that, having that drive, having that passion, having that energy that really scrapes you out of bed every day. Yeah. You can't wait to go. I can't wait to keep doing whatever you are doing and having a team sharing that passion is it is what what uh makes it really worthwhile doing i mean at the end of the day yeah success money because i'm not dismissing those we are living in a realistic world and these are important tangible things but uh they are not the main motivations they are rather very plausible byproducts yeah that makes sense to me i mean and some of the most fulfilling work I've done, you know, I mean, the money has been good, but that wasn't the reason I did it. I did it because the projects were fascinating and I felt like I could lend something to that field. And so it sounds like that's, that's your motivating factor more than anything else. Absolutely. I applaud Absolutely. that. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. So I guess one thing I'd like to ask just from where you were talking is, um, as your organization's grown, mm -hmm. are there any values or, um, just kind of rules of thumb or, you know, mission statement ideals that you felt just didn't really fit in anymore that you had to adapt to, you know, to grow it? I mean, ideally your vision and mission statements are generic and, and bold and audacious enough that they are actually elastic enough to, to live through multiple stages of the company. And that makes sense. You don't need to go and revise your mission or, or vision every time you, I don't know, grow the, the company a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the way you are catalyzing um, the team around it has to change. So okay. there are interesting phases again uh, that I'm going to go back to right sizing. Sure. So uh, when you are just starting, when you are a very small, very intimate team, your communication overhead is very low. Everybody can communicate very intensely and all the time with everybody else because this is something manageable. And that basically keeps everybody completely in sync. If there are any disagreements, they cannot live for long enough because everybody is communicating with everybody. So the uh, disagreements or different directions, etc., will have to solve themselves very, very quickly. And that happens very naturally. Nice. As you keep growing, you have to start bringing in deliberate structure into the way you are organizing and the way you are communicating. And that's when communication starts becoming a challenge. What's the size at which you kind of fit that hurdle, like roughly? I think, well, maybe that's different for every organization and probably. it's difficult to generalize based on just like one data point, even for us, probably that could have gone differently in, in, in different universes. Uh, but sure. uh, it's like from, from almost zero to like 20, 25 is one thing. Yeah. 25 to 50 ish is one thing 50 to 70 80 is, is another <laughs> thing i don't know when when is our next kind yeah. of stage it's probably not 100 like yeah 180 or 80 and 100 are relatively very close but maybe around 150 or so that you have to um rethink certain things again and as you grow your bandwidth increases but your efficiency tends to decrease. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. And communication overhead tends to increase. Absolutely. So the battle is uh, battle shifts from the day to day battle shifts from how am I going to do the leaf work? How am I going to do the actual technical work or actual actual work of sorts, whatever needs to be done? To how am I going to organize? So that as a team, we can get the work done in this increase. So it's, it's basically, uh, you are trying to optimize for efficiency. Yeah. But efficiency will, uh, contradicting the required increased overhead in the community. <laughs> so that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating phenomenon. I completely agree. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting to observe that as well. But like I said, I don't think I've ever led a team that large. So for me, it's, it's just, I didn't really either. Weird. So that's a learning experience. Are there any like advisors or mentors you turn to, to help figure it out? Was it most well, like a lot of people? There? I mean, I, that's, that's one of the, I mean, I, 
I claim credit for very few things in life, but sure. somehow managing to be the dumbest person in the room is what I excel at. So <laughs> no, that's I, <laughs> I, I always, uh, I, I've been extremely privileged, extremely fortunate to always have access to uh, people way more knowledgeable, way more experienced and way more smart than, than I am. So uh, that, that continues today. I'm very fortunate to, to have access to a very distinguished set of uh, people as mentors, as advisors. That's incredible. Um, and they are extremely generous with their time and with their, with their knowledge. Yeah. Of course, what you need to be aware of is that no one is going to come and run your organization or your team for you. Of course. At the end of today, that is still on you, but uh, you at least have access to different uh, opinions, maybe past experiences and guidances and advice. So you have to take those and do something with it. Yeah. I mean, I agree, right? I mean, there's a couple of advisors I personally go to. And I mean, there's been times when, you know, I've had a difficult decision. I haven't been able to get a hold of the person that I know would know how to solve that problem. Like, well, I guess I have to make a decision and roll with it. You know, as Zig Ziglar said, fall forward. So. Pick a lane. <laughs> so. Excellent. Yeah. 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 That's, um, and again, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very humbling experience to, uh, learn from people who have done this before, or who have seen situations like that before. It's extremely good. Uh, if you actually have access to people who can give you contradicting advice because they have, I agree. they have seen uh, similar situations panning out differently, different universes. Yes. Different <laughs> universes. Exactly. That, that little, the tale of two cities. Absolutely. <laughs> Dickens yeah. universe. I find that fascinating as well, because you could see, you know, how it went and, and sort of just pick aspects of both sometimes in some cases like in mind. Well, one thing that again, uh, for, for me or for us in general as a company. Of course, we are relatively early. There are a number of things that we have to wait and see or execute and see how, how they turn out to be. But one of the things, again, based on like looking at around and, and trying to understand the underlying mechanisms, there is a significant uh, role of luck. Like, or luck as in the collection of all the things beyond your control. Um, <laughs> I like that. That's a good definition for luck. Uh, it could be good. It could be bad, but uh, anything that is an accurate you... definition for luck. Right. right. Exactly. Good luck or bad luck. Um, so being aware of that is also, I think, keeping that in perspective is great because, and maybe that's like a little piece of unsolicited advice to, to whoever will be listening, uh, especially people doing a startup or considering doing a startup, uh, it's an inevitable roller coaster from, from afar. Every company looks extra, just like the social media. When you look at Instagram, everybody has perfect lives. There's yeah, nothing wrong. Never there's, true. there's not, yeah. And in, in reality, that cannot be true, uh, for, uh, for the companies, the, the corporate version of Instagram is LinkedIn. So when you look at the, 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 it's LinkedIn, the only social media, it, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, everything is just up and to the right, but, uh, <laughs> in, 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 inevitably in the, in the reality, yeah. every company, even the most successful companies have good days or bad days, ups and downs. And yep. that doesn't make, uh, anyone less perfect or less successful. It's just the reality of the game. So. Knowing that there is a great deal uh, of factors beyond your control uh, should give you an even keel perspective there. So when something super good happens, yeah, like pat, pat yourself on the back and cherish and celebrate for sure. But don't fall into the trap of a like, egotism, egotism or like a premature victory lapse. Um, and similarly, sometimes not so good things will happen again. Yeah part of life. Don't be, don't take anything personally or don't, don't, don't go into these like huge swings filter, almost like apply a low, low pass filter to whatever is <laughs> happening to you in life. 
I really like that. I mean, that's <laughs> that's uh, wise, I would say. Um, it maybe takes away a little bit from the celebrations, but uh, it makes up with the uh, the grief. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I think just to realize that not everything is is your fault or your your credit. I mean, is is to like you said, keep an even keel and be able to just react you know more uh that's the word i'm looking for reasonably to those scenarios i mean that's 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 beautiful yeah yeah that's again uh these are this is also like another data point like nothing is universal or proven or these are just my opinions based on what i've seen my opinions could have been different had i seen different things so yeah put that in the perspective as well it makes sense. I mean, I don't know. I feel like the more I personally see as well, the more I tend toward just, you know, all right, let's not crack the champagne just yet. Or, yes, I know that sucked, but it's not the end of us. You know, we will have better days and everybody makes mistakes. Now, what are you going to learn from it? You know? Again, like, yeah. Come back the next day and make more mistakes, other different mistakes. Yeah. So long as they're different. <laughs> So what are uh, what are some of the technical challenges that you found yourself mm. up against and, and maybe working on or solved or you know yeah I mean um, walked away from I, I don't know combination so I mean as you know and as as maybe some of the the listeners will know we have a, a, a drastically different approach to uh, autonomous driving instead of um, trying to go for a completely driverless level four uh, system in one shot, we are going there in a series of stages. Smart. The main motivation is to be able to get to the first stage that is on our path to eventual uh, complete solo driverless. That first stage, we can uh, get to the market, start deploying faster, start creating value faster, and of course, in the process, become a viable business faster. Yeah, makes sense. So what we are doing is we are deliberately decomposing the problem in such a way that we can get a subset of the tasks, focus on it, and first get to first do one thing before we go on to do the next thing and the thing after and the thing after. But even with that down scoped, if you will, I'm not going to call it easier or simplified because there is nothing ever easy or simple about complex robotic systems. But the downscoped version of the problem is still incredibly complex. Yeah. Thousands, if not tens of thousands, and maybe sometimes even millions of little leaves of like moving pieces here and there that you have to um, somehow orchestrate uh, and unify the end is a very tall order. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of uh, coordinating work. And uh, again, the, the, the work itself is challenging. Building the machine that will build the machine is very challenging <laughs> too. Um, Makes sense. So the technical challenges uh, are, of course, um, uh, not unlimited, but uh, it, it quite a few in numbers. In our particular case, uh, being able to build a system that will be able to handle the nominal operating cases within our operational design domain that we craft for this very first version, which is a human guided convoy system consisting of two semi trucks and two drivers taking turns. There's a driver engaged in the lead truck. There's a driver in the second truck, but oh, cool. the, the driver in the second truck is not actually driving. It's uh, in the bunk. It's in the sleeper berth, resting, yeah. taking the federally mandated rest as the truck drives itself and follows the leader from a close distance. So effectively, one active driver helps moving two trucks at a time and two drivers can periodically swap places. So you never have to go down. It's almost around the clock, you can have a uh, an operating convoy on the roads. You can this way deliver twice as much cargo to twice as far and twice as fast. That's incredible. While uh, 
reducing the operating costs significantly, reducing the fuel consumption and associated carbon emissions significantly. Awesome. And basically making the crafting a win-win-win for all the stakeholders involved. So this is this is a great problem uh, definition. To make that happen, we need to make sure that we are designing a system that's going to be able to handle the nominal use case. It also should be able to handle a number of off-nominal situations. And it should be able to safely respond to edge cases. Yeah, yeah I and agree. Edge cases are different than the off-nominals. Yeah. Off-nominals are cases that we can imagine, we can think about. Edge cases are things that we don't know what they are. Okay. That's so what makes them real edge cases. That, I think that makes... So an off-nominal is, is what I've always called an edge case, but it sounds like that's okay. not the normal scenario, but it's something that you foresee and you've planned for. Yeah, for by definition, yeah, by definition, you cannot even talk about an edge case because you cannot imagine it. If you okay. can, if you can I imagine mean, using that word wrong, so I appreciate you. Oh, about like it. It, it's not, it's not, it's not you. It's the the general way of the like. What about construction zones? Well, but that's not an edge case because we can think that that's going to happen. It's guaranteed to happen. It's off nominal. Yeah. Uh, and edge cases. Well, what if you actually saw an elephant in the middle of the road? Well, since I can actually imagine that, it's even that is not an edge case. Yeah, like <laughs> an edge case is fill the blanks. Yeah. So. Um, they are out there. The edge cases are out there. We, uh, we just don't know what they are. So you need to be able to design a system for the nominal. We need to be able to design a system for off nominal and edge cases at this to safely respond. And if push push comes to shove, be able to achieve a safe uh, like minimum risk condition and execute a minimum risk condition maneuver. Yeah. Uh, of course, you need to have the hardware to support that. It has to be uh, properly built against these, again, nominal and optimal cases about uh, uh, around failure characteristics. And it needs to be architected in such a way that for any reasonably foreseeable combination of failures, you are not going to pose a safety risk. Yeah, and, and probably doing that, I would imagine you accidentally engineer against some of those edge cases. Because by looking at enough off nominals and combinations of off nominals, if you are if you are taking a systems engineering definitely. approach, and if you are, uh, whenever possible, it's not possible for every part of the system, but for the parts that are possible, if you are taking a top down, uh, systems level view, yes, the 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 conditions that you are covering, will actually cover rather large parts of the, the universe. I'm sure there are some edge cases hidden there, but you are covering it at a more fundamental level. But again, we don't know the details because we don't know the, the, the edge case. So building the hardware for that is challenging. Building software for safety critical systems, it has so many uh, little dimensions and tentacles around that. It's, it's uh, a very um, tedious, and intellectually challenging task to craft a software architecture, a hardware architecture that will do the job. It is very challenging to prove that what you just designed actually will do the job. So coming up with the design and building it is a form of technical challenge, proving that it actually does the work. It, 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 it is the right design is another challenge. Once you can, once you get past that, so now you know that you have a good design, uh, being able to uh, figuring out how to actually build those in quantities. So you're, just because you have a good design does not automatically mean that you can actually manufacture it in quantities according to that. Absolutely. So quality control, it's, there is a whole uh, slew of uh, subjects there. And then once you be able to manufacture those, how are you going to deploy them? What is the what does your product life cycle look like? How do you maintain them? How are you going to maintain them? How are you going to repair them? Like it, it requires a significant amount of backtracing and preemptive thinking. Yeah. Uh, and that actually uh what we are doing 
when facing these kind of challenges, we always seek um, simplicity. Nice. That's smart. Simple is is elegant and and beautiful. And I know uh, the usual tendency is to one up spec wars. And if just I'm gonna put more sensors, more cameras, more this, more lidars, more computers, more <laughs> GPUs. But these are all of that yeah. These, the these are all great more solid state disks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these these, yep. these, <laughs> these are all great, of course. Who I would guess. do that? Yeah, I have no idea. Maybe a guy I once knew. Uh, but if you are think, if you are back propagating from your end goal of actually having successful products at scale on the roads and in the real world, all of a sudden you are actually incentivized to keep your design simple because every extra component that you put there is another point of failure. Amen. Uh, so having that kind of sage wisdom <laughs> when you are actually under enormous pressure to solve an incredibly challenging problem these are contradicting forces sure. being able to manage that is an, an enormous and day-to-day -day challenge i can't claim that we have figured it all out and it's all that we are now great again we wake up every day we go to work we enjoy going to work and we work on this challenge we we make it a little bit better we make a few more inches of progress that's a that's an ongoing um battle yeah that makes a lot of sense to me Th this is probably a really dumb question and, and please forgive me i'm sure there's a lot of nuance i'm missing but you mentioned the convoy system why not just have two drivers in the same truck with one in the sleeper cabin oh well, yeah yeah you can have that but um so the from an operational point of view, the, the big advantage of having two drivers in two trucks yeah. is that when you break the convoy, what you fall back to is a traditional one truck, one driver system. Awesome. So that enables us to, again, everything is for getting to a deployable state faster, right? So that enables us to get to a point where we can actually limit the autonomy's responsibility or autonomy's uh, operate, uh, operational design domain to just highways, uh, but have the drivers individually drive their trucks manually when they are not on the highways yet. Usually, when you look at the anatomy of a of a long haul route, a long haul route is usually a handful of miles before you hit the long interstate segment, and a handful of miles after you yeah. exit the interstate. So you can target, and typically 90 to 95% of long haul routes are the interstate, interstate. segments. Yeah. So you can target that big, long stretch for autonomy to, to, uh, to be active, and you can fall back on your human oh. drivers just for the beginning and for the end. That is why it makes more sense to have two drivers uh, be in, in to be, be in their individual trucks rather than having both of them in the same cab. There's also a historic challenge, and it's a very basic human uh, challenge actually, uh, to have two individuals occupy a rather limited space sure. for prolonged periods of time. So being able to get them to work as a team, but still provide people their own personal spaces. There is a, a an intangible quality of life aspect. Absolutely, I mean, you know, every crude vehicle, pretty much since you know, before World War II, I mean, has been a lot of people crammed into a very tight space, and so that's cool that you're you're kind of keeping the camaraderie, but giving people their own sort of freedom to go around. That's Absolutely, a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Have Have you looked at all at refueling technologies to sort of go with this? Because I feel like that. So that's your next thing is we got to stop for gas. Right, know. right. Uh, not really uh, in, for the initial uh, initial years, at least, because uh, what we are looking is to we are looking to uh, have the convoys um, operating for 20 to 22 hours a day. Oh, wow. With uh, two to four hours of downtime. That downtime is reserved for refueling, 
pre-trip and post-trip inspections, which are very important for safe operating of, of uh, commercial trucks today. Yeah. It will be extra important for safe operation of autonomous trucks. I believe it. Um, and maybe very light maintenance. Not With that not... kind of capacity, you're getting to Texas from Pittsburgh. I mean, that's that's a pretty good distance maybe not that much but uh, you are actually you uh, you will be able to do like a thousand miles in one shot okay cool so across the states would be three to four stops depending on the route yes um the, the main use case we anticipate is going to be roughly 500 mile round trips oh then you're so perfect. like we we, you basically start from this location, you do 500 miles, 500 miles back, you end up in the same hub or same starting point. Yeah. And then next day again, next day again. So it's like a very boring, but That's super awesome. efficient. That makes sense to operation. me. And while you're loading the trucks, you're also probably refueling, which, you know, now you don't have downtime anymore. You can, I mean, even today, when you look at uh, how the, especially uh, mid to large size fleets operate, um, refueling is a highly prescriptive operation. It's not just, hey, I'm running out of gas, so let me go ahead and fill out. People are actually tracking gas prices, in, especially in different states. Cool. And if you are routing, so you can basically uh, prescribe and you can tell the drivers to fill up at a particular location because overall it's going to make more sense from a pricing point of view. Sure. So that, again, we are not... Uh, every, Everywhere possible, we refrain from inventing new things or adding more friction or adding behavioral change. So we would like to piggyback on existing workflows, existing habit, exact, existing uh, ways of uh, doing things, unless what we are going to propose is going to make the, the, I don't know, significantly more efficient. That's a very level-headed way to go about solving that problem. There is a... And you have to acknowledge that certain behaviors exist for a reason too. Like, sure. Of course, there's maybe some antiquated um, uh, elements there that are just there out of sheer habit, but a lot of it is also um, pieces of knowledge and pieces of experience that as outsiders, we don't know, but the industry developed that over decades. Uh, so there's maybe some merit in some of those, at least trying to understand that helps. I completely agree. I mean, when trying to solve any problem, I always try to look at how could people solve this problem before? Have people solved similar problems before? What problems don't look similar, but really are similar in the solutions that you can port over? And I mean, you know, you can make things that would be unachievable from scratch, you know, achievable that way. So that's, that's a brilliant way to look at it. If you try to do everything, you're just not going to accomplish anything. So We don't think we are that good. <laughs> and humble. <laughs> we are we are just, uh, I mean, so here's, here's how I look at it. Uh, if we manage to stay focused, stay on mission and manage to deliver on our promises. And if we can build one thing, we will buy ourselves enough time and resources to go and do another thing and then another thing. So life naturally happens in those sequences. Of course, if we could, if we could have a magical wand and I touch and we make the entire transportation problem go away. We solve everything magically. <laughs> that would have been fantastic, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, that so not unrealistic. Again, uh, let's let's pick the best bank for buck, the most uh, reasonable scope down version of the problem with the most outsized value proposition. Let's solve it, and then identify the next one, and then identify the next one, and always continue like that. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. No, I mean, <laughs> divide and conquer. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. Divide and conquer, exactly. Yeah. So, cool. Well, I mean, is there anything else that you're interested in talking about? I guess, you know, what, what do you think about, you know, what's... Obviously, working with awesome people seems to be a pretty core part of your... Oh, that's uh, the dream job. That's, yeah. the, that's the dream job. I like um... it, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's a good place to cut it, then. Yeah, that's wonderful. Sure. That's wonderful. Did you like it? Nah, I'm glad you finally made it in. It's really good to catch up with you. It's been oh. years since we've got to see each other, since you know Tekken introduced us at the CMU yeah, event. that was maybe like ago. a decade ago, close to a decade ago. Now, yeah, ish. Right? I mean, it may, at least eight years. I mean, 2013, 2014, something like that. 
Wow. Yeah. And I think uh, we, we ran into each other at one of the, the uh, PRN events. Yeah. I, I that find this, very is, brief. this is a great way to hang out with people because, you know, it's with the interview format, you learn things about your friends that you would never know. <laughs> you know that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty effective, actually. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's been a bunch of folks I've had on here where I, I've known them for years, but I've never really gotten to know anything about their work and just, you know, naturally you kind of get it, you know. Fun stuff. So, Chetan, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> if you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. But we're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.